with the evening, uh, getting into our scriptures tonight, getting into our message. It is uh, going to be a topical sermon tonight, um, so I'm Typically, I preach more of an expository uh, sermon, but tonight is going to be more of a topical sermon. A thought that's been on my mind for the past several weeks. So, Zechariah and in uh, verse four and uh, in chapter four, looking in verse ten, the first part of this scripture here says that, uh, "For who hath despised the day of small?" things. Father, again, we come to you tonight. We thank you, dear Lord, for all that you've done and for who and what you are. And we pray this evening that you give us guidance, grace, and mercy. Lead us into the right way that we may be pleasing to you. And Father, I pray that you take your message tonight, Lord. I pray you expound it upon our hearts. Uh, Lord, I pray that what need each and every soul has this evening, uh, Lord, that you would meet them, that you make a difference in their life. In Christ's glorious name, we ask these things. Amen. Well, we live in a world uh, which will judge his success quite often according to numbers. According to, uh, they'll, 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 they'll judge their, their worth, their benefit, even their blessings, and you know, which is strange, based upon numbers. And you'd be amazed, guys, to, to see how many businesses today who, who are actually unprofitable but yet have a, a high annual revenue stream. So I want to bring this thought to you tonight, this thought on despise not the day of small things. Despise not the day of small things. We know the verse says, for who hath despised the day of small things, that is Zechariah 4.10, but we're only using that verse, that thought, as a springboard to go into where we want to this evening, understanding where and who we are in the life that we've been given. Because I want you to understand, and I want you to understand very clearly, the success, success in this life will never be based upon the numbers. It will never be based on, on things that are great. As a matter of fact, the greatest king to ever live was ridiculed by his own brother uh, prior to his victory over Goliath. And this is what he said in 1 Samuel 7, 28. And Eliab, the eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness and thy, of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You guys know the story uh, from 1 Samuel 17. Uh, David slew, uh, slays uh, um, a Goliath. He takes five rocks up, picks one of them up, swings it with a, slings it with a, a sling there, hits him between the eyes, goes over and takes his own sword and cuts his head off. As a matter of fact, King Saul, who was a pathetic king, uh, he put the, his own armor on David. It was too big and it was, it was just kind of weighing him down. He says, I can't use these. They're not proven. I can't I've never used these before, but he said, my God will deliver me out of this hand of this. He looked at this. He said, this Philistine, this Philistine, who is this guy, right? He said the same way he delivered me out of the mouth of the, of the lion and out of the bear. And he said that uh, you know, a lion had came and taken one of the sheep. David goes after him, and he takes the, the, the sheep out of the, the mouth of the lion, and then he destroyed the lion. He said the same way he's done that, he's going to deliver me out of this, this Goliath, this Philistine. It was nothing to him. Why? His faith was so great. His faith was so strong. He wasn't worried about it. But his brother, because his brother wasn't chosen to be king, because David was anointed to be king, this little ruddy boy, which is a ginger-haired boy, if you will, this little boy. So his brother says, those few sheep. You know, those few sheep you're responsible of. That, thy pride, huh? That's what he's saying. And we know that David would become... Really and truly Israel's greatest ruler, if not the greatest ruler this earth has seen to date. A man after God's own heart. So what I want to say to you tonight, you are infinitely worth more to the creator of all things, the Lord Jesus Christ, compared to what your life may contribute to the everyday aspects in these days. Now that may not sit well with you tonight. That may not make a lick of sense for that matter. And I'm not diminishing our work on earth. And I'm not tonight, I'm not minimizing the value of your life. Your life is worth more to Jesus Christ, believe it or not, than anyone on this planet. You say, preacher, I just can't understand it. You mean Jesus Christ loves me more than my wife, my husband, my son, my daughter? My... Absolutely he does. Absolutely he does. You see, my friend, I know something. I know for an absolute fact. Should my days end today, life in Cardiff tomorrow is going to continue on just like it did the day before just like you did the week before. I know I am expendable. I am replaceable, and this I know. The day would move on, it would move forward in such a manner to make my life no more than a flicker. 
My life while it's breathing and beating hard and uh, living is very precious. For all life is precious. And I mean from conception to the grave, all life is precious. Life is a gift from the life giver and the life saver. Which is going to make my point tonight. What makes life so important? It's not the numerical value that one can summate. But rather from whom life is given by. Therefore, the single individual's worth is based upon the one who gave them the ability to live, gave them the ability to love, as well as give them the option to choose him as their savior. I am not valued according to my financial contributions. I am not valued according to my family connections. I am not valued according to my my favorite character. That's not where my value is found. But rather, I am valued because if mine or your life was the only one needing saving tonight, the Creator of all things would have went through everything that He did on the cross of Calvary, be buried in the grave, and risen again just to save you. If we reveals what your life is worth, and I say this, despise not the day of small things. Now, we want to see the excitement in this world today. We want to think of how important is our life. And we want to see the great movement. And we see the films and we read the books. And we see all of these things that build up this theatrical climax in people's days. And as they write a fictional characters in books or films. But there was a group of 70 disciples in the days of Jesus on this earth. And they were given the power over evil spirits. All right. That's a topic for another time. And we probably can talk about that later on. Matter of fact, they were given so much power that the serpent would not harm them, the scorpion would not hurt them, and they would be able to cast out devils from people. And this is in the days of Jesus, okay? This ain't today. When they returned to Jesus Christ, they were rejoicing over this power. They came back to him, and they and uh, they came back and were saying, man, you're not going to believe it. Even the spirits were subject unto us. We were out there, and, and we were doing this and doing that, and man, we were casting these devils out. And this was the Lord's reply to them. This is what he said. He said, notwithstanding in this, rejoice that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Well, we don't look at it like that, do we? You see, my friend, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us the power over evil spirits and scorpions and serpents. It may be a great thing. In all fairness, that's a great thing. All right? But the Lord said there's something better out there. There's something better that you should rejoice in, and it should be that your names are written in heaven. Let me ask you a question to make it very personal this evening. When's the last time you wept a tear that you broke out in utter gratitude, that your heart melted? When you thought of what's in this world to come, when you thought about your name being written in heaven, the last time that happened, I bet you got excited over a film you watched or a book you read. I bet you got excited when your favorite team won. Alabama won 53-3 yesterday when they they beat Vanderbilt. Not a great win because Vanderbilt's Vanderbilt. But what I thought was funny was that uh, the three points they did score was a kick, a field goal by a a kicker who transferred from Alabama to Vanderbilt. So technically, Alabama scored all the points (laughs) for the whole game. Was I very excited about it? No, because it was Vanderbilt, okay? But I will say this. When's the last time you got excited over something in this world? Success, numbers, financial, whatever it may be. Compared to when the last time you got excited about your name being written in heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. Philippians chapter 4 verse 3 tells us, that I entreat thee, also a true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with all, I mean, with other my fellow laborers, watch this, whose names are written in the book of life. Can I say this to you? When your name is written in the book of life, it's written in the blood of Jesus. It doesn't come out. You know, I, I'm, am I saying tonight that being saved is a small thing? No way, no how. It's the greatest gift. It's the greatest decision. It's the greatest choice you'll ever have in your life. But our culture plays more emphasis on big numbers, larger crowds, more ways to comfort someone today in the world that we're living in. We're trying to figure out ways to make people's life better here and now, and yet we're forsaking what's in the hereafter. I'm going to tell you this tonight, and I'll be honest about it. It may come across a little bit harsh, but my friend, 
Jesus Christ didn't die on the cross to make a better world for people to die and go to hell in. But rather, to give them everlasting life beyond these worlds. So, hey, listen, despise not the days of small things. You say, what in the world is a small thing? What we are. We are. 7.4 plus billion people in the world today. Okay? Like I said, if my life was over, my, my family obviously would be hurt. I, I get that. But businesses are not going to stop. Car traffic's not going to stop. I mean, life is going to continue on. I remember uh, 2007, 29th of October, 2007, we had taken our trip over to the United Kingdom. We landed in, it was actually in, in Northern Ireland. It's the first trip that we made over here. I was preaching a meeting over there. And then I flew over for two nights and preached here in Wales and went back to Northern Ireland. Denise and I and a, and a dear, dear couple, friend of ours, uh, him and his wife. And um, I checked my company, my corporate email. And coming across the email was the announcement that a certain individual that was in my area um, had passed away. All right. And so I shot an email back to the VP. I said, hey, listen, if I can help out in any way, let me know. His, within 30 seconds, his email back to me was, BJ, if you want to add this office to your bonus group, you can add it to your bonus group. Long story short, I ended up doing that. But as after we got back to the States, we were in a... Um, um, Murfreesboro VA clinic. It's the Veterans Administration. We were in an amputee clinic down there. And it was me and several of my colleagues. All of us would be considered competitors, but we were colleagues, practitioners, one with another. And we're evaluating amputees that are coming in and making suggestions and all this and that. And this individual that passed away, he ended up dying of pancreatic cancer, he was sick for a long time, none of us ever knew this, uh, named Dan. Uh, you know, he used to be in that clinic with us. And so I sat there and I thought, man, we're going about our daily business. We have 30 some odd patients who are going to come in this morning. We're all going to evaluate them. We're going to make suggestions to them. The physiatrist is over there writing everything down. This one over there. We're all doing the very same thing that we were doing when Dan was here. So that's what I'm trying to tell you tonight, guys. Despise not the days of small things. Why? Because our life in the gamut of 6,000 years, the 70, 80 years that we may or may not have in this world, it's, it looks as a small thing, but despise it not. You may be sitting here today wondering about these small things. One person, one family, one city, one village, one country, one governmental system throughout uh, the world, uh, uh, and how, you know, are so engulfed with worship in this earth, if you will, and uh, they're pushing the, the Great Reset, and they believe in, that if 2.5 billion people need to be exterminated in the world to, so the earth would survive. You look at that. I think they're deluded, they're deceived people. Um, they don't see the value of one. They look at, collectively, if we can get rid of two billion people, that the, earth, the earth's going to survive as long as God wants it to survive. Get your faith in order. Amen? It, that's how. That's, I'm not saying we should litter. I think we should take care of our own business and take care of our own place. And if each person takes care of their own place, guess what? Things will take care of themselves. But you're not going to destroy this earth. You ain't that powerful. Trust me. God created this thing, and he's going to make sure, he's make sure it's resilient enough to take care of business. Do you understand that here? We talked about the curse on the earth last week. But I'm saying all that to say this. We have a deluded populace today because they don't see the value of small things. They don't see the worth of one. And I'll, I'll say it again. I'll say it in a different way. You, in your life, is infinitely worth more to the Savior than to you or anyone around you, anyone that you can even imagine, even those closest to you. They don't love you as much as Jesus Christ does. That doesn't mean they don't love you. Don't take that wrong. Don't leave here and say, well, he said my family. No, they, their family loves you, all right? But no one can love you as much as Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Luke, in verse chapter 15, it says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. More than 99 just persons which need no repair. I love that. I love that idea. The heavens rejoice. The angels sing when one person accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in this world. One. 
Our world doesn't look at that. Our world looks at, let's reach the masses. Let's get as many people as we can. And let's shoehorn them in. And if we can just get the masses, then we're going to be successful. Then we're going to be popular. Then we're going to be worth something. No, no, no. One life is worth more than you can ever imagine. The parable reads on in Luke 15. See, neither that woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and, and seek diligently to, till she find it. And when she hath found it, she called her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece of silver which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. In other words, one that gets saved. Think about it. The one soul that needs salvation, all of glory. I don't know how many angels there are. I know there's bill, there's millions upon millions of them. I know that. But I have no idea how many there are. But I can know this. When one individual in this worth gets saved, I know this on the, 30, the 31st of December, uh, 1999, I know they shouted for glory when I got saved. 27th of October, 1998, when that dear lady right there got saved and born again on a Tuesday night, they got, hey, they shouted for glory then because of one soul. <clears throat> the Lord will send, man, the Lord will send the dogs out to find a soul to be saved. He'll send the dogs out to, to find a soul for the gospel to be heard, for them to repent, believe, and to be saved. But here's the caveat tonight. All heaven rejoices when one soul is saved. The angels rejoice before the throne of God. When one soul chooses to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, one, you, that's where your life is worth. So where, where how do you find success? Numbers? Where do you find your worth? The masses? No. You. One. The Lord Jesus Christ, more often than not, worked in the lives of individuals. He spoke uh, of the lives of the individual. And we think that a larger crowd is the more evidence of success. But Jesus Christ tells us a different story. He sees the value of the individual soul. And again, we are infinitely worth more, unfathomably loved, greater by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, than we can ever imagine. And we need to get our ducks in a row. We need to get our life in order. We need to get our faith in order. And understand that as much as you love this world, this world is here, it's here today and gone tomorrow. As much as you love your life, it's here today and it's gone tomorrow. Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, loves you more than anyone ever can. Now, three people that I want to talk about tonight, three evidences that I believe in all my heart is proof. There's a lot of scripture going to be read this evening. I pray that you dig in. I pray that you sink in and grab a hold of it. I want to talk to you first about a messed up woman. A messed up woman. John chapter 4, one of my favorite characters to preach on in the Bible. It's a woman of Sychar. John chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though he, Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, uh, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, and, uh, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city in Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. Now we're going to stop there just for a second. We're going to read here in just a moment. Those of you that are familiar with this event, we understand that Jesus goes and sits on Jacob's well outside of a city called Sychar. We just read that, which is in Samaria. But here's the key. The Samaritans and the Jews had nothing to do with one another. They hated one another. As a matter of fact, the, Jew, the Jews considered the Samaritans to be unclean, and they were to have nothing with them. They would not be seen with them. They would not be around them. They had nothing to do with them whatsoever. That's how it was. That's why the, we hear about the story of the Good Samaritan, when a man from Jerusalem goes down to Jericho, and he falls among thieves, and yet it's the Samaritan. You know, the Levite comes by, crosses the street when he sees him. The priest comes by, he looks on at me, he walks past him. But it was the Samaritan, the one that was has, have no dealings with those Jews, that if the Jew, if he had been awake, he probably would have had nothing to do with him. It was the Samaritan that loved him, took him into the end, patched up his wounds, and then said, I'll pay the bill later on, giving evidence of his integrity. You see, that's what makes that. The Good Samaritan is a great story. What makes it so much powerful was who did it. So back to this lady here, this woman, this messed up woman in Sychar. Jesus Christ 
forsook all the societal norms. He forsook all that was considered legal, law, you know, popular. Why? Because of one woman. To speak to one lady who was messed up, and we'll see here in just a moment. So let's keep reading here. John chapter 4, we're going to read verses 7, 7 through 19, then 25 and 26, make our point. And so then come the woman of Samaria to, drink, to draw water, and, and uh, Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink, for his disciples who gone away in the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, uh, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Verse 10. Now Jesus answered and said to the woman, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is uh, that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, and he would give thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep, and from whence then hast that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Verse 14. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, for the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of, of, well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus saith, Go, call thy husband and come hither. And here's the kicker. The woman answered, said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast, thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou hast is not thy husband, in that thou in that saidest thou truly. The woman saith unto her, So I perceive that thou art a prophet. Verse twenty five down the, down we skip down just a little bit it says the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And guys, I read I realize a load of reading, but get the idea here. We're going to tie all this together in the end tonight, these three characters that we're going to look at. But I want you to see who, what happens. The Lord goes and sees this woman. Not only is she a Samaritan that he, Jews aren't having anything to do with, but she's a woman that, that Jesus Christ said you had five husbands. In other words, she was an adulterer. She was shacking up with another guy that wasn't her own husband. It was somebody else's husband, and she was shacking up with him now. And the Lord just rebuked her of that. He just brought that out to her, right? And she says, man, you're telling me everything that I've ever done. So first thing that we find here, the importance of one soul. We see there's a messed up woman in place. And beloved, I tell you, despise not the days of small things. Second part I want us to see is this, this uh, maniac of a man. You guys probably know the story I'm going to, and we'll get to it rather quickly. But it, it comes out of Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9. We're going to settle in verse 15. And then we'll move on to our third one. We'll tie all three together tonight. But in chapter uh, one of, I mean, chapter five of Mark, uh, the book of Mark, in verse one, it says, "And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadareans. And and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because they had, uh, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him." And the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he had said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked, What is thy name? And he answered and, and, and saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, beloved, I know the big push in the world today is pronouns and all this and that. All right, And I'm not going to get started on it because we'll be here next 30 minutes with me ranting over the idiocy of this. But I'm going to tell you something. and I, I think we see who's referring to themselves as thee and them. Yep, I said it. I am Legion, for we are many, he says. You see, verse 15 tells us, and they come to Jesus and seeing him that was possessed with the devils, the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, they were afraid. What happened here? What's the story here? Here's what happened. A man who no one could tame. We, we could take that and we could even apply that, that, uh, that, that modern day healthcare, psychology, uh, psychiatry, drug, whatever, all of those things, they couldn't do anything for this guy. 
None of them. Now, we see in this day, they tried to bind him. They tried to tie him down with fetters. They tried to hook him with chains. He just broke him asunder. And you know why? Well, his name is Legion. What does that tie into? A Roman Legion, guys. Now, guys, this wasn't, he wasn't just possessed with one devil. He was possessed with anywhere from twelve to 36,000 devils. A Roman Legion was anywhere from 12,000 men to 36,000 men. You understand? That's why that is so important. That's one reason the guy could not be bound. I mean, he was wreaking havoc on the townsfolk there. And the end result after coming to Jesus was that he was clothed. Now let that sink in for just a minute. Makes you wonder why people always want to take their clothes off in our culture today. He was in his right mind. He was, came back to himself. Remember that prodigal son who was down with the pigs getting ready to eat the husk that he had just fed them? And he said, the Bible says, when he came to himself, he says, man, my daddy's house. Good night. I'm down here eating pig food. My daddy's got all what? He came to himself. He was in his right mind. Not only that, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. That was his, his gratitude, his worship, you understand, his love. Why? Because one man, one man now in his right mind. Jesus, asked, uh, uh, Jesus was asked to depart from Gadar. It seems like Jesus Christ crossed that lake, crossed that Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, crossed it for one reason. That one guy. It seems like Jesus Christ went into Samaria for that one lady. One soul. Thirdly, let's look at the melancholy member of state. I had to come up with an M, guys. Forgive me. Acts 26, I mean Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Another one of my favorite stories. The Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that, that, uh, that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candice, queen of, e of Ethiopia, of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to, the Jer to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet, prophet then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Now I want you to get the picture here. The Lord sent Philip on a mission. He, went, he sent Philip on a mission to find a man in a chariot reading from Isaiah 53. Well, I don't know where he acquired that copy. I do know this. If somebody gave him that copy of Isaiah 53, it's the greatest gift to date he would ever receive. If he purchased it, and we know he was of great authority, he was basically the, the Secretary of State, if you will, or of the, of the Treasury Department of Ethiopia. Uh, if he purchased it, he did so with a great sum of money. But it doesn't matter how he got it. It matters that he did get it. His purpose for coming to Jerusalem, according to verse 27, was to do what? Was to worship. He was convinced that if God would be found, that he would be found in the holy city of Jerusalem. But when he arrived, I imagine he became distraught, seeing the city a place of commerce, a bed of commercialization. And to top it all off, he found out that his status as a eunuch, according to Deuteronomy 23.1, he could not even be allowed to join Judaism because he was a eunuch. And the Lord thought otherwise. Philip the evangelist made haste, joined himself next to this melancholy member of state, and, and picking up where he, had, where he was in Isaiah 53, he witnessed unto him Jesus Christ. And we find in the next verses as we pick up at verse 32 to 39, it says, And the place of the scripture which he read was this, and he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? Verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, verse 36, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hindereth me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the, and, and that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went away, he went on his way rejoicing. Think about it for just a second. 
This guy came to Jerusalem to worship. He came from a pagan country who were pantheists. They worshipped the birds and the bees and the sycamore trees and all that. He was a pantheist. But he knew there was a God, one God. And he figured, if I'm going to find this one God, I'm going to find him in Jerusalem. And he gets there, and it's not what he had thought it was. And he gets there, and he finds out he can't even be part of that religion. He was distraught. One Ethiopian eunuch, one man, who was melancholy. What's the end result? He's now rejoicing. Why? Because he believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he was baptized by immersion and went off. Why? Because his soul is infinitely worth more to Jesus than anyone and anything else. Beloved, despise not the days of small things. Don't look at your life and say, well, it's just me. I'm not that important. To the Lord Jesus Christ, you are. So what is the conclusion of all these things? How do we tie these three people together and say, despise not the, the days of small things. This is one person. What is the results? What's the results of these three individuals being loved, sought out, secured, and yes, sealed on the day of redemption? Well, in Sychar, the beautiful thing about that, the gospel was heard by the people. So the door for the gospel to be opened up to Samaria. Look what happened. That woman believed on Jesus Christ. And in John 4, uh, verses 28 through 30, the Bible says, The woman then left her water pot and went her way to the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And then they went out of the city and came unto him. Do you see the importance tonight? Do you see the importance of one? One person, one soul? Now I'll bring you back to verse 4, where Jesus, where it said of Jesus Christ that he must needs go through Samaria. Friend, it would have been much easier for Jesus to take the high road into Galilee on the easy path alongside the River Jordan where everybody else would have traveled. And instead, he, uh, he trotted the mountainous plains of Samaria. Why? To get to this one city where this one woman with a messed up past would come down to get a, a, a jar of water. And that one woman went in and testified, is this not the, the Christ? Why did he do it? For her. And she opened up, this messed up woman opened up the gospel to that entire city. I mean, we're talking about a lady that, that other wives would avoid. They would walk down the street, and she came, and they would squeeze her husband's hand. You better not look at her. I mean, I could just imagine. You know how people are. Human nature hadn't changed 2,000 years, man. She was infinitely worth more to Jesus Christ than what other people thought, than what she was to the people of that town. The result was Jesus spent two more days in the city and the whole city seemingly came to salvation. John 4, 39-41 says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them and he abode there two more days. Two days. Many more believed because of his own word. One soul, one person, the power of one individual. For the maniac, well, we've already seen that he was in his right mind, saved, born again. Well, obviously, he wanted to follow Jesus Christ, wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't you want to get on the ship and go with him? Jesus says, no, you're not going with me. Mark 5, verse 18 through 20 says, And when, when he was coming to the ship, uh, he that had been possessed with the devil uh, prayed him that he might be with him, how be it Jesus suffered him not, but say unto him, Go home to thy friends. And tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath compassion on thee. Verse 20 says, He departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men, all men, I'll say that again, all men did marvel. One man. You know what Decapolis means? It means ten cities. Bet Sheen is one of those cities that he went through. Tell him the great things that Jesus did for him. The gospel was known, opened up the door to thousands, if not millions, because of this one man, that Jesus crossed the body of water and witnessed to one man, cast out the devils of one man. One man was saved, and therefore thousands and millions came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch, I mean my soul. History tells us of him. We know that he went away rejoicing in Acts chapter 8. Remarkable story, beautiful story. But it's just one man, Right? Beloved, despise not the days of small things. History tells us that that Ethiopian eunuch took that gospel back to Candice, the queen, and therefore it opened up the gospel to the entire portion of North Africa. This one man brought the truth back to his country, and it was made known throughout the land, and more than likely throughout the whole continent of Africa, if you will. 
The first of the gospel to flood through the land, resulting in the saving of the souls for centuries to come. I'll tell you a quick story. We'll be done tonight. I was reading a book one time about a, an old preacher in the early days of, of air travel, and he was traveling to another city to preach a meeting. And as he was traveling to this city, uh, he sat down next to this man. He heard him speak. He heard him speak with a uh, with a foreign uh, foreign language or a foreign dialect, and. He was dressed up in a nice suit as well. And the old preacher leaned over and said, he pulled a little gospel tract out of his pocket. He says, man, I'd like to, I'd like to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. I mean, he's thinking, what a blessing it is. Here, I got a foreigner. Surely, you know, I'm going to witness him. He's going to get saved. And the guy said, preacher, man, I really appreciate that. He said, but I'm already saved. I'm born again. I'm, I'm myself. I'm a preacher. He goes, oh, great and wonderful. And he says, what, what American missionary, what great American missionary, led you to the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes, no, it wasn't American missionary for me. It was my father, who's also a pastor, who led me to the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes, oh, that's such a blessing there, brother. He said, what great American missionary led your father to the Lord Jesus? And this went on a couple of times until eventually they got down to the British missions. You know, he finally said, what great British missionary came to Ethiopia and witnessed the gospel to you? And he finally said, sir, listen, we can trace our heritage, our Christian heritage in Ethiopia and our church all the way back to Acts chapter 8 where the Ethiopian was saved, the Ethiopian eunuch was saved and brought the gospel to our land and the gospel went throughout. Beloved, despise not the days of small things. You sit here tonight and you think, well, I'm just one person. What difference can I make? Why can't I get as many people as possible to, to talk to them and speak to them? Why, why can't we look at the big numbers and the big ways and look at the masses? Guys, we never know exactly what the, world, what the Lord is doing in our world, in our lives, and the lives of those that are around us. But I can assure you of this. When it seems like it's just a small thing, it very well may be a single act which swings the door open for the gospel to go in places that you would never be able to get it. Despise not the days of small things. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and time to be together tonight. I pray this message would ring true into our hearts and our souls, that we would understand that Jesus Christ loves us infinitely more than, than we love ourselves, than others would love us, that our life is precious, that it is important, and for our Lord and Savior to die on the cross for us, be risen again to give us victory in this life and the next. Lord, let us not be shy. Lord, let us not be shameful. Let us proclaim his truth and everywhere we go. Father, I love you. I thank you. And I do thank you for the days of small things. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. I hope and pray that the preaching and teaching of the word of God was a blessing to your heart and your life tonight. I ask you.